truly beautiful. Ah, and now it is my great pleasure to invite to the podium for our inspiration, our encouragement, our beloved, John the Beloved, our pastor, our teacher, our friend, and our guide. Please come forward, Doctor. Doctor! <laughs> Good morning, family. <laughs> this morning, I had uh, Carol Charlton, one of our practitioners, drove in right behind me, and she tells me that as she passed Marshall, who was taking, giving out tickets at the gate and welcoming people, Marshall is one, as you know, of our two caretakers, and this morning he was at the gate. She said to him, any news of the hurricane? And he said, he said to her, me no mind pon it. <laughs> Let us say that together. Me no mind pon it. And as I welcome those who listen to us on the World Wide Web, that translates as, I do not have my mind centered on that. <laughs> so welcome, it's wonderful for us to be sharing this morning. And what I have my mind on, came to me from a friend who called with concern about the approaching storm. And he, as we talked, he had asked me to pray for peace for him. And so I did. And then as we were concluding our discussion, he said, stay inside during the storm. Little knowing that he was uttering a metaphysical and universal truth, that when the storms of life begin to blow, the place to go and to stay is inside. Me not have no mind, Pani. <laughs> Meaning the outer world. And yesterday I received an email from Sherry Jensen, who was one of the youth advisors who accompanied the group of teens from Colorado who visited us earlier this year. And she, had, of course, had, knew about the approaching hurricane. And she was... Um, emailing to say that we're in our heart and in our prayers. Isn't that wonderful? I'm certain that we're being surrounded and upheld at this time by the powerful energy of prayer from thousands of Jamaicans and well-wishers, both at home and abroad and throughout the diaspora. And it's just wonderful. Yesterday, the pump for my water storage tank at home chose this particular time to stop working. And friends, I have to admit that I began to feel buffeted by the mounting anxiety evidenced by people in the supermarket who were unable to obtain water or bread as the entire nation braces, note the word, braces for the hurricane. You know, when you brace, what do you do? You stiffen up, you tense up, and when you are tense, you simply cannot function. Well, I was in the line at the supermarket near my home, clutching a loaf of freshly baked, delicious smelling bread, that mega mart bread. Long, long line. And, you know, I suddenly realized that I am buying into this frenzy. I just put on the bread from the nearest <laughs> counter and go on my yard. And I said, time, John, to meditate, to go inside and stay there during the storm. Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great teaching, writes, and I quote, at the center of my being is peace. That peace that is felt in the coolness of early evening after men have turned from their labor and the first star shines in the soft light of a translucent sky. There is a freshness, a vitality, a power underlying this peace. It broods over the earth qu quietly, tenderly, as a mother watches over her sleeping baby. End of that quote. Friends, let us allow this peace to hold us gently right now as we affirm together at the center of my being is peace. Can we say that? At the center of my being is peace in a half voice. At the center of my being is peace. In a whisper, at the center of my being is peace. 
and know in your heart silently. At the center of my being is that peace which passes all human understanding. And friends, the sort of happiness generated when you go within to find this peace, that happiness, that, that sense of inner joy is far different from the fleeting gratification that comes from physical pleasures. It is a lasting joy that transcends any apparent dangers in the outer world of form, and it is untainted by external circumstances. To attain such happiness, you must first discover its nature, its source, and then be willing to accept it at its price. And there is a price we have to pay, the price of diligent spiritual practice. Reverend Sonia and Reverend Anne Shand have a class on a Thursday evening which is about spiritual practices. And really, you should give yourself the gift of coming to even one class. There are a whole range of spiritual practices that we can use to take us to that place where the spirit of peace is enthroned in perpetual splendor in our lives and in our affairs. So it's a price well worth paying. The nature of happiness, my friends, is so simple that it is usually ignored. Its origin is so wonderful that it is rarely understood. The Greeks had a word for it. It was eudaimonia, E-U-D-A-E-M-O-N-I-A. -E eudaimonia means having a good spirit. When you have a good spirit, Plato spoke of his daemon or his inner guiding spirit, this good spirit that guided his, his life's footsteps. And another philosopher, Pascal, went a step further and defined the source of the good spirit thus, and I quote, Happiness is not within us or without us. It is a union of ourselves with God." Unquote. Happiness is neither within or without. It is more than that. It is a union of our very souls with God. You know, there once was a king who yearned to know the true meaning of peace. So he offered a prize to the artist in the realm who would paint the best picture of peace. And many artists tried. The king and his court looked at the pictures, but there were only two he really liked, and he had to choose between them. One picture was of a calm lake. The lake was a perfect mirror for peaceful, towering mountains all around it. Overhead was a blue sky with fluffy white clouds, and all who saw this picture thought it was a perfect picture of peace and tranquility. The other picture had mountains too, but these were rugged and bare. Above was an angry sky from which rain fell and in which lightning played. And down the side of that mountain tumbled a foaming waterfall. To the court, this did not look peaceful at all. But when the king looked closely, he saw behind the waterfall a tiny bush growing in a crack in the rock. In the bush, a mother bird had built her nest. There, in the midst of the rush of angry water, sat the mother bird on her eggs in perfect peace. So which picture do you think won the prize? One or two? Yeah, there you go. The king chose the second one. And do you know why I quote him? Because, explained the king, peace does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. Peace means to be in the midst of all those things and still be calm in your heart. This is the real meaning of peace. And I always marvel at um, the, the participants in our, our, our um, correctional outreach at the Tower Street Prison, because we meet so many people, don't we, Reverend Michael, who have this sense of inner stillness. Well, me and I make myself to find one loaf of bread, which I'm not supposed to eat at the supermarket because they expect rain to blow. You understand me? They get a meal, and if they don't like what was cooked, that's it till tomorrow. 
and they have this sense of stillness in their hearts and this, this sense of being aware, aware of God, which is just, just far surpasses anything that I have been able to attain um, or that I've been working a, a long time to get there. Those, my friends, who have a clear concept of this happiness and who possess it know that its attainment does not demand too high a price. But to gain this kind of stillness, you must know yourself, set a goal, and work towards self-fulfillment. To thine own self be true is the essence of abiding happiness when you work toward development of your higher nature. And when your goal is based on honest self-knowledge, this is a sound foundation for the greatest degree of self-development. And this is why I love this study, of the study of this teaching known as the science of man, because it brings you back, it throws you back upon yourself. And Reverend Emma used to say, it's me, it's me, from that hymn, Dear Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Not my father, not my, my mother, not my brother, not my sister, it's me. That's where the work has to begin. When we sing every Sunday, let this peace begin with me. So this teaching gives you a, a tools that you can use to access that unity, that conscious union with the Almighty that is the quest of every human heart and every soul upon the planet. The attainment of that union, I want to suggest to you, requires three steps. The first step is accepting God's existence as a truth. It does not require any specific concept of what God is or what he, she, it is like. It does, however, require belief that one has created a specially planned, precisely planned, delicately balanced universe. That this one created all things out of itself. Belief that this balance, as well as the ultimate goal of its perfect operation, depends on the complementary interaction of all its parts. And that's the essential thing. All its parts are interrelated. I think of a, a, a web. I have this beautiful image in my mind of a spider web. And wherever it intersects, there's a tiny jewel. That's where we meet each other from heart to heart, from soul to soul. And all of us are connected. There's this lovely, lovely image um, that a butterfly flutters its wings in the Amazon jungle and a star trembles, and it starts a tsunami, perhaps. So this belief in, a, in the truth of one God, one infinite intelligence, one presence, and one power is the beginning. It's the first step towards our conscious union with the divine. The second step, accepting the truth that you are just as vital a part of creation as any other part, awakens an awareness that your acts and thoughts either contributed to this delicate balance or detracted from it. You are in life and whatever you think and feel and do affects life. So, you know, Reverend Emma always told the story about a group that um, had a huge row over who should be in charge of the group. And the group was, de was devoted to establishing peace in their community. So you start a group dedicated to peace, and what you do, you quarrel the first meeting. Does that make sense? No. The third step, and this is the big one in my view, although there's no big or little in spirit. The first step, my friends, is surrender. It's the most difficult of them for me. Because it is possible to believe a thing wholeheartedly and yet find it almost impossible to take the step necessary to utilize such knowledge. I know that I need to exercise more. I know that, I believe it. And whenever I feel exercise coming on, I sit down till the feeling passes. <laughs> it takes about 10 minutes and then I begin to feel like John again. So you say you can take this step only when you can absolutely trust that God's will for you is the highest good you can imagine for yourself. 
and that once you take your claim as a beloved expression of this one, you can let go and allow God to bring it about in the best possible way for you. And this is what is meant by, and I quote, not my will, but thine be done, unquote. But you must have implicit faith to be able to let God's will be done. Only the fear of setting a self aside stands between many individuals and their attainment of an indestructible happiness. And once you take this step, everything in your life will take on a new meaning. Your perspective concerning yourself and others will change. You will see the apparent storms and so-called tragedies in your life differently, and step by step, God will guide you to your rightful place to be doing what you came to do, which is to be a purveyor of peace and to make a difference in a world that really works for everyone. In 2003, when Dr. Elmer Lumsden accompanied Reverend Sonia Davidson, Anne Shand, Michael Record, and Errol Thomas to Monterey, California, for the intensive, which would determine whether we got the nod to be made ministers, Dr. Elmer wanted me to go shopping with her one afternoon. We asked the hotel receptionist to get us a cab, and she said, just wait outside, the taxis pass by every few minutes. And true to her word, two taxis pulled up to the curb within minutes of all being outside. So I took Dr. Elmer's elbow and respectfully guided her toward the one in front. But she said, no, dear, let's take the other one. So when we got in, I asked her why she didn't take the one in front. And she said with a twinkle in her eyes, the one in front has a bumper sticker affirming, God is my co-pilot. I understand what he means, but I want a cab in which God is the driver. <laughs> that woman was something else. Trust me. <laughs> she know he's in her. That bumper sticker was echoing a mindset that many of us have, though, you know. It goes something like this, how we think. I drive and God is my helper. I call the shots and God does my bidding. Unquote. I don't know about you, know, my friends, but my life doesn't work very well when I try to call the shots. In fact, when I do, I find myself in some deep yogurt. <laughs> friends, if God is your co-pilot, you need to switch seats right now. Right here, this morning. You need to let go to surrender and simply say, over to you, God. Let's say that. Over to you, God. As my grandmother used to say, Pupa Jesus, take the kiss. Yes. yes. So when you give over the controls to God, God opens avenues for expression of your innate talents and abilities and desires, some of which you may never even have been aware of. You acquire a wonderful sense of inner well-being that is unruffled by the hurly-burly and the, the angst of the outside world. And you have opportunities to fulfill both material and spiritual needs beyond even your wildest expectations. So last month, September, Reverend Michael and I at the prison started our fourth year of classes. And as you were told this morning, or as you know, Reverend Anne and Carol Charlton begin at the women's facility this week. But during that time, Michael and I have found many, many bright men who have said, if it wasn't for being in here, I wouldn't have learned to read and write. Simple as that. I wouldn't have learned to play a guitar. Some have said, I wouldn't have learned that I have the ability to teach others. And I remember one saying, we have this exercise where they choose an object to represent their personality, and one of the objects is a, is a candle, and one of them chose the candle. And then they have to say their name again so we can learn it and say why they chose these objects. And this guy held the candle and he said, I've always been a light, but I was lighting people down the wrong road. Oh. Never thought of it in that way, eh? You think of light, you know, all spiritual and warm and fuzzy, don't you? But you, you can be a light and really lead people the wrong way. And what had gone on for him in his head in our class and since being in that facility 
is that he can be a light that takes people into righteousness and into the discovery of their deep spirituality. And those guys, I tell you, I can't wait to hear Reverend Anne and Carol, if the woman if, if, um, exhibited too. There's this deep, deep yearning for God and this deep, deep sense of fellowship with the divine that I find absolutely enviable. So you know the wonderful thing is your cooperation with God, your cooperation with God eliminates the need for you to compete. There's no competition. I just uh, asked a, 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 an acquaintance of mine a week or so ago, how is new business is going? And he said, not bad, you know, but you know the competition is stiff. And I had to remind him. You see, if you make God your CEO, and you're a paymaster, and you're a senior partner, and allow God to be the pilot, there is no competition because the universe has provided for all everything that you could possibly need. And therefore, there can be no competition. There is enough. And just, just raise your own bar and compete with yourself. Can I do better today than I did tomorrow? Can I be more loving today than I was yesterday? Can I have a closer walk with God so that when people see me, they see that light burning brightly from the altar of my heart and seek to find that light at the center of their own beings? My friend, friends, that each of you should have a deep abiding peace and happiness is God's desire, and it has been God's desire and intention from the beginning of time. We have the choice of happiness in God or unhappiness and frustration in a consciousness apart from God. And however pleasurable life may seem apart from God, one day you will find that your soul is hungry and your heart empty if you don't have a spiritual practice that draws you closer to that spirit of life and love and joy which created you out of itself and that calls you to its service in every facet and relationship of your life's experience. And so this brings me to your assignment. You think because rain or fall and breeze are blowing, you're not getting an assignment? You're lucky. Your assignment, should you un decide to undertake it, is to take time today to go inside and there recognize God as all. That's the first step of treatment. Just recognize God. The first step of our affirmative prayer is just recognition of God. And unify yourself with God by affirming your oneness with the one. You may say, I and the Father are one. Can we say that? I and the Father are one. And then declare, and I'm going to give you this affirmation, from the peaceful center of my being where God abides. Can you say that? From the peaceful center of my being where God abides. I say to the storms of life, peace be still. I say to the storms of life, peace be still. So let's say that from the peaceful center of my being where God abides, I say to the storms of life, peace be still. Together, from the center of my being where God abides, I say to the storms of life, peace be still. In a half voice from the peaceful center of my being where God abides, I say to the storms of life, peace, be still, in a whisper. From the peaceful center of my being where God abides, I say to the storms of life, peace, be still. And now silently in your heart, And the wind and the waves will obey you. Namaste.